excited to have uh, Todd Zakrysik here with us um, from the uh, University of North Carolina. Um, he's an associate research professor and assistant director of uh, fellowship programs in the Department of Family Medicine there. Um, he serves on several boards, uh, including the, the Journal of Excellence in College Teaching, the International Journal for the Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, um, the Higher Ed Teaching and Learning Portal, um, Tech Enriched Instruction, uh, which is a Microsoft um, program, and uh, the Communicating Science and K-12 board. Uh, currently he's working on faculty development, um, and effective instructional strategies, and student learning, um, areas of research. Uh, he's co-authored um, the two books I'll mention here, uh, Teaching for Learning and the New Science of Learning. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll hear and was um, received the National Award for Innovation in Faculty Development from the project. Long time ago. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks for thanks for being Thank you so much. Thank you. So, so I'm getting more and more confused these days. So one of the things I find when you teach psychology, so I started out as research, as, uh, I was actually, I didn't start out as a research anything. I guess I was collecting data at a very young age. Um, I started out uh, in my academic career here in Southern Oregon University and I was a, assistant professor, got promoted associate professor, got tenure, had fun with that, then I rescinded tenure and went to Central Michigan and started playing around with faculty development stuff. I built a center there, did that after seven years, got a chance to go down to University of North Carolina and then moved over to the medical school. When you teach psychology, something cool kind of happens. In your intro psych class, you tell everybody all the neat stuff that happens in psychology. And then about the second year or so, you start teaching, I taught statistics and then methods and then like cognitive psych. And when I got to cognitive psych, I started telling people, well, there's a lot of stuff we don't know, but we do know some things. And then I taught history and systems in capstone course. And in capstone course, I'd be teaching, well, actually, we don't know much of anything, but there's certain areas we're really making some progress. Then I went off to graduate school, and I spent probably the next four years looking at cognitive aspects of performance appraisals, trying to figure out if maybe I could shed a little tiny bit of light on how you actually evaluate an employee's performance when you might only evaluate them once every six months, but you see the performance every day. What actually plays into that? And the point I'm making here is I started with this concept of here's what we know and got all the way to here's a tiny little area I can make a contribution. Teaching and learning is the same thing. I started out feeling like, okay, here's some great stuff about teaching and learning and here's some stuff that we all know. And I'm getting slowly to that spot where kind of wondering what we actually do know for sure. But there are some things we know for sure and there's some things that we know don't work very well. So we're going to play around with that area just a little bit. So. I've got like five major points, and I've numbered them because if I number them, you're more likely to remember them if I don't number them. So here we go. This is a great quote that, or a statement that I have. Learning is best when it involves the learner. Okay, this is ridiculous, right? <laughs> Concept here is that if we don't involve the learner, if the person's not involved in the process, learning is actually very difficult. But there's a concept we're going to get into in just a minute in terms of how people learn. Now, we've been teaching and learning for a long time. Here's actually something from about 900 years ago. The concept, if you think about it for a second, is what happens if there are no books, just for a moment. No books, no internet. There are certain individuals who know things and other people do not know things. If you're someone who wants to know something, you have to go to the person who does know things and that individual would have to show you, whoops, that individual would have to show you what it is that's going on or tell you and that would be here, of course came out of the church traditions here, and then these individuals would want to write it down so you don't forget. And what's cool is lectures from like 900 years ago have some interesting phenomenon if you look up here and you'll see this. See, this is, those are the excited people, those are all in the front row. Those are the students that are going to sit up front and write down every word you say. And then back here you have people with side conversations. And then you've got a dude here who's sleeping, you got the TAs down here, and then, this is so weird, one person texting. <laughs> now the difference is nowadays we have many more people texting than we used to, but the idea here is that little by little, you know, this is kind of what came out of it. Now, 
If you think about it for just a minute, teaching is the profession that makes all professions possible. That's Todd Whitaker, I like that quote. Teaching is the profession that makes all professions possible. If you think about how far we advanced from here, just take commercial travel for example. For commercial travel and what we are able to do now versus just 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is amazing. Televisions. Televisions 50 years ago were these tiny little black and white TVs. You remember what used to happen at midnight? Anybody here old enough? Yep. At midnight, this, they would play the national anthem, and then it would go down to a test pattern, and then it would either go down to a dot or just go to snow. And all, everybody in here is my age or roughly my age. We used to just stare at the TV until 6 o'clock in the morning until it would come back. No, actually, what we used to do is sleep. It was weird. So now it's different. But the point is, you had these little televisions. Now we have jumbotrons that are the size of buildings. So how has education changed? Massively. We have bigger rooms. All right, that's kind of mean. <laughs> Concept is if we think about how far the field of education has helped other people to go, we should be making some massive changes, which we are making some. But the concept here is we should be moving a little quicker. So today I want to play around with a couple of concepts. So here's the first one. Think about an average first year course. You come in, the student comes in, sits down, starts to, to starts take out notes and stuff. The teacher starts to lecture. How long before the students are going to get bored? So what kind of time spans would you put on this? How long before a student gets bored when you start to lecture? 20 minutes is good. How much? 15. That's even better. 10. Ten. Nicely done. Nine. <laughs> I had a sense of where this is going. All right. Any other numbers? What other numbers you got? Five is good. Where are the true pessimists in the crowd? There's a one. <laughs> Well done. The best number I ever heard probably for an actual number was minus 30 seconds and that's when, in, when a student's walking into the room thinking, oh man, it's going to be a lecture. <laughs> I'm already bored. So that we get anywhere from now zero up to 20 minutes, right? So those are all over the place. But try another one. So we have some issues there with lecturing. So we could work at that for just a second. Here's another one. Person picks up a book. I am not going to argue about whether or not people will read. I see books around all the time people will read. So just for a second, if you do come in and sit down for a lecture that's listening to a lecture, if you pick up a book and start to read, how long before a person gets bored while reading? Wait, depends on what? Okay, it depends on what you're reading. What else would it depend on? Your motivation. Your mood. We got at least, I got to get to at least seven here. It's blood sugar, yes, the blood sugar, your ability to actually pay attention to it. That's a good one. Now we're up to four, we can get to seven. Yes. Yeah, looking at the book thinking, wow, this thing goes on forever. So that's a good one. Time of day is a good one. The, the, the purpose behind reading, what's the interest of this thing too? So we got, oh, we did it, we got up to seven. So the interest, the purpose, the blood sugar levels, all those things, you know what I find intriguing? I have done this now on my own campus, about five or six different groups, and I've done it around the country for about another eight or nine groups. Just did this a few times total, maybe 15 times. Every time has had the same result. How long before a person gets bored during lecture? I get time estimates. Every single time I said, what about reading? And the very first response is, it depends. Why does it depend for reading and not for a lecture? And if you think back about those things that you just said it depends on, for a lecture, what if we took your list from the book and transposed it onto the lecture? Blood sugar, time of day, interest, the thickness of it. <laughs> whether it's present, whether the information is, is legible, is, is um, accessible or not accessible could be another one. Whether you're required to sit there versus not required to sit there. You read it versus you're required to read it. The fundamental thing I'm after on this one, and we do know this, but I'm not hearing people talk about it, and I'd love to have them do it more, is the difference between the reading and the lecturing. They're fundamentally one-way pieces of communication, that which a lot of people would call passive learning, and yet we think about them fundamentally differently. Think about a bad movie. If you walk out of a bad movie, how many times do you walk, and I have a terrible time walking out of a movie. Once I'm in there, I gotta see it through to the end. Usually I meet my wife down the street at a coffee shop an hour later. She has no problem walking out. I've never seen people walk out of a movie though saying, wow, that movie was quite complex and I'm not sure I have the cognitive capacity to really truly understand that which the, uh, the director was going for. No, usually we say that was a terrible movie. So we put it on the movie very quickly. So I just want to be careful because the books, we talked a lot about the reader characteristics 
And very quickly for the lecture, we go right to the students getting bored. And so that's where we got to be a little bit careful. So here's another one um, that this came from, actually. I shouldn't say another one. Where this whole discussion came from is a couple months ago. Someone in the medical school at UNC was writing an article about active, engaged learning and lecturing and said, I've gotten to the portion of the article where I've written that after X amount of time, we have to change things up because students get bored. Okay. She said, could you please find me a good article so I can plug in the amount of time? I've put 10 minutes in there as a placeholder. Could you find me a study that I can cite and the amount of time that should be put in there? The next thing was what I normally do. People call me a lot with these things on my campus. And I say, sure, no problem. I can get to you tonight. Then I went and searched the literature. I checked the medical literature. I checked the psych lit, which is where I go for most of my stuff. Um, but I looked all through the literature. You want to know what I found? I found hundreds of articles talking about students getting bored in the classroom. I can't find anybody who's collected data. There's some mind-wandering stuff out there that's close. There's some self-report stuff out there that was really weekly done, but quite frankly, and I don't mean like every week, it was weekly done. Um, but there's also some stuff out there from the 1980s on heart rates, basically demonstrated that when students come into the classroom, their heart rates are up here, and then through the first 20 minutes, their heart rates go down like this. Well, that's obviously boredom, or people running to class with backpacks. <laughs> In fact, sometimes when my heart rate is down very low, I'm still not bored at all, like, a frosty beverage, an Adirondack chair, and an ocean. You know, I can be fairly relaxed and still engage thinking deep thoughts. So the point there is, I can't find the data. If you think about it for just a second, you researchers in here, think about this. How would you even operationally define these variables? We, I think this can be done. I'm just waiting for somebody to do it. So the point is, without self-report using something other than heart rate, which is a pretty nebulous measure here, we'd have to just define what do we mean by boredom. Oh, we'd have to control for the lecture. We'd have to control for the content. We'd have to control for interest level. We'd have to control for complexity. We'd have to control for length. The point here is we have to be really careful before we make a global statement like every 10 minutes we have to change things up because people get bored, at least till we find some data on that. Now we do know that mind attention can go down even without specific data, we know it can, but instead of framing this is because people get bored, let's do engagement. What if we reframed it to there's a certain point at which the cognitive load is high enough and you've gone through enough material that you need some application or to do something with that as opposed to just getting more stuff. There comes a point, as hard as you want to pay attention, that if you cognitively, if you're full up, you're just going to be done. And by the way, novices get really full a whole lot faster than experts do when you're talking about new information. So just that concept of thinking it through. Okay, so here's your, your final exam on this slide. How long can a, if you're doing a flipped classroom, how long can a video be before the average watcher is going to be bored? Seven minutes, depends. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> this is good. I got a copy of my book I'm going to give you. This. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Who said the seven minutes? <laughs> yeah, that's yours. <laughs> you knew better. <laughs> Oh, wait a minute, that was mean. <laughs> All right, was that borderline mean? That was, uh-oh. <laughs> All right, well, go over to the center and they'll give you a copy. <laughs> I had three copies when I came here. What happened to the other one? Give you one, give you, All right, I'll figure it out. Hey, remind me, I got you a Bloom's Taxonomy slider. It's right over there, you can have one of those. Oh, let's do that. Now I feel bad, ah, gosh. It's my snippy little attitude, gets me in trouble. Uh, could you pass this back? Thank you. All right. It's actually, it's better than the book. Okay. <laughs> now, yeah, it depends. But when people are flipping classrooms over and over again, I'll hear folks say, make sure your video is not more than three minutes because students won't watch it. Yeah, they will if it's good. And if it's bad, you want to know how, think for a second of how quickly you become bored watching a video that's a bad video. I can usually make it about three to five seconds and then I'm done. So if you're going to sit behind a desk and read to the monitor the notes, then that's going to not work out. So again, if we rethink this, so we're not talking about amount of time before someone gets bored, but rather what information has to be present to not make it boring, and then what's the absolute load we can do before a person can't process it anymore, we have a different conversation. But I have so many people out there talking about shifting things up because of the boredom. Let's stop using boredom as a defining characteristic. 
That's what I'm after. Along that same line, active versus passive learning. I mentioned before I'm becoming more and more confused, so here's my confused one. I cannot figure out as a cognitive psychology who's been dab cognitive psychologist dabbling in this neuroscience stuff. And by the way, brain-based learning is stupid. Um, and I got to say that only because I was a I was a guest editor for a journal, uh, Excellence in College, teaching a special issue on brain-based learning. I've done some workshops on brain-based learning. I'm doing it because I'm pandering to those crowds out there. I will admit it. Because I keep thinking to myself, what's next after brain-based learning? Do we have like spleen-based learning? We sure we have some monosynaptic motor reflexes that we have, but I don't see that as a whole line of inquiry. Um, the concept here is that pretty much all learning is brain-based, right? Pretty much all there. Now here's one, passive learning. What would be, I'm just gonna ask you for a second, what the heck is passive learning? We got an idea what this would be? You I've back to the top before the knowledge and then you slap it on. All right. <laughs> the IRB committee gets really angry <laughs> if you suggest that as a research design, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to try two things. I'm going to put people into groups and I'm going to peel these heads off. So <laughs> basically the person just sits there and information is poured in. That's what we call it, right? That's typically what we call it. So what are some examples of passive forms of, of learning? What kind of pedagogical process would you be engaged in? Anybody guess? The what? Lecture. Lecture is definitely one. So what's another one that's similar to a lecture? Reading. Reading? All right, reading could be it. Videos, watching a movie, that would be, yeah, that'd be kind of passive. It's basically sitting back and letting the information come one way into your being, right? I'm just saying this because that is very, very common verbiage I hear all over the place. Active, engaged learning goes together. You're doing stuff. We're broken into small groups. We're really messing with this thing. Service learning, team-based learning, problem-based learning, pogo stuff, flip classrooms. We got all this stuff going on. That's all active. Passive. I'm sitting back and letting stuff just come flooding into me. I think that's a terrible dichotomy. And I would love it if you could just help me out. I've just started this recently, just pushing this out to just get completely rid of this. Because I'm thoroughly convinced, in fact, there's some good evidence on this, that sitting back and having information poured into our head or watching a lecture or watching a movie or reading a book can be very, very active and very, very effective. As I said that statement, I actually have, you notice the hesitation in there? Because that whole concept of just even saying out loud, you know, reading a book can be informative. That kind of would mess with us if we, if we somehow ran a study and said, you know what's weird is small group work does a really good job in long-term retention, but reading a book seems like it's a waste of time. Um, that would change our whole educational landscape. So here's the issue we get into. Passive versus active. What we're really talking about here is the extent to which the learner is involved in the learning process. First of all, all learning has to be active because neurons have to fire in order for the learning to happen. And then learning happens. The question is, is it transient? Is it going to hang around for very long? You know, if you cram the night before the test, you go in the next day, it's all gone. That's not passive learning, that's transient learning. It's, it comes in and it's gone. So the question we have now is what helps it to stick around for a while? So here's an interesting concept. Suppose, a, suppose an individual watched a movie and then got really nervous going in swimming in the ocean. Now if a person actually could change all of their behavior and their whole life view and change what they like to do simply because they watched a movie that made them afraid to swim in the ocean, right? then it'd be bizarre because it's a very passive situation. I'm sitting back, I'm having this information come to me, and yet behavior changes. In fact, just watching that movie can change it. If you are now, anybody in the room thinking of the title of a movie right now, all right, which is weird because that movie happened a long time ago. If you've ever listened to a lecture, I listened to a lecture I was talking about earlier today, I've listened to lectures that in a matter of seconds changed my entire worldview. I never got into a group, I never stood up, I never did anything, but sit there and say, oh my gosh, that's amazing. Now before we go too far and I make the Center for Teaching Learning folks really ang angsty here, <laughs> you should never do active learning, you should always lecture all the time. Um, no, that's not the argument here. The point is, let's not dismiss lecturing completely. Let's not dismiss this passive learning concept completely and in chain, instead change the framework a little bit. So what is it? Whether we're pouring information in, and the pouring information is actually a really good way to describe it because in some respects that brings up the image that the learner isn't really 
seeking the information out, it just happens to be there. But the concept is whether, and I'm going to try to cross a, a, a boundary here that doesn't get crossed very often. I'm going to say it doesn't matter if it's active learning, engaged learning, team-based learning, any kind of think pair shares, jigsaw, a lecture, a movie, anything you're exposed to. Let's go for four this time. Four things that have to be present if you're going to remember that which you're exposed to a couple of months later or a couple of weeks later. Say anything past like a couple of days. So what has to be present if you're going to have this later? Yeah, attention's number one. If you don't attend to it, you can't learn it. If I'm walking along and the person in front of me trips and falls over something and I think, wow, I'm going to step aside. Ooh, here's one for you. One of my students said he was walking in New York City and apparently they didn't latch one of those grates where they, they deliver the packages. And so he was walking along and the grate flipped and he slid down the delivery chute into the basement of this place. The owner comes busting through the door and says, what are you doing in here? Get out. <laughs> he says, I, you know, I didn't want to be here. And so they went through that whole process. The rest of his life, he will not step on one of those grates. That was very active learning. He was very engaged in the process. The person behind him, though, walking along and said, whoa, that dude's in trouble. That's, I'm not involved directly in it, but I've seen it, right? So if I attend to it, that changes how I might step on grates. But imagine for a second I was walking and the person fell in the grate behind me. And if I kept walking, I'm the same distance from the person, but because I never attended to the stimulus that's being presented, I never learned anything. So you have to attend. I promise not to go that long on the rest of them. But you have to have attention. Now what else would you need? Yes. Practice. Practice, practice is a good one. If you practice and do something with it, we know that if we practice at retrieval, we actually strengthen the pathways to get back to the information. So we have practice. So we have some prior knowledge. Prior knowledge is huge, very good too. And so if we don't have some relevant prior knowledge, which has huge implications for individuals who are learning from less impoverished or more impoverished environments than other people, so that individual becomes, that becomes a difficult situation. So the relevant knowledge, so you can hook it. Because now what we're actually talking about is elaboration. If you can take information and hook it to stuff you have from before, if you can practice at the retrieval, and if you attend to it, huge characteristics and then one more there we go we'll go with interest you ever notice the big difference that you all feel when you're actually listening to something you're very interested in versus listening to something that's boring listen to next time that you're really bored at a story somebody's telling by the way there's a whole other component there that's kind of a fun side note we oftentimes don't even process what we're processing like you'll become bored and all of a sudden you say, wow, I'm bored. Next time you say, wow, I'm bored, think about why you're bored for a second. It's really kind of an interesting concept. This is what I do when I'm bored, so I get less bored. <laughs> I get bored watching a lecture and I'm thinking, wow, I'm bored. What is it that did this? Oh, you know what? There's enough redundancy here that that repetitive information lost its value. Hmm, repetitive information lost the value. Number two, it's I don't even care right now. I don't care. <laughs> and when I go through and list those types of things out, I can figure out what it is that's happening. But if you have the four things you mentioned, it changes how we process it. So, instead of talking about active versus passive learning, we could talk about the extent to which learning scenarios have things like those characteristics. Now, they're out there. We've talked about them for years. But we don't usually put them in the category and move away from this dichotomy into the other dichotomy of to what extent should these things be there. So, I think there's a huge potential there. Um, well, there, we just did that one. We're way ahead. We have lots of stuff happening right now, and there's lots of different ways of engaging the learner and things, even starting at a very young age. Um, this is actually an Opolgo thing, so that's a process inquiry-based learning. Um, we have, as the way humans are structured, a huge affinity to, for storytelling. We can weave stories together so well. So in some areas, when you learn in some areas, stories work incredibly well. There's other areas, you know, organic chemistry, it's harder to tell some of the stories. Um, you know, if you have to learn formulas, in formulas it's hard. People actually will try to make up stories about formulas through mnemonic devices. Mnemonic devices, that's funny. You pump them up and they're really good. No, it's mnemonic devices. So there you go. So through the his mnemonic devices and stuff, we try to tell stories. The point is, storytelling is incredibly effective, but it doesn't always work. Learning is changing completely in what it looks like. Somebody can be sitting in a classroom, sitting in a classroom while they're sitting anywhere. So these things happen. But the thing I really wanted to point out, I don't really want to, um, yeah, I'll come back to it. 
is this. This is from D. Fink's um, Creating um, um, Significant Learning Experiences. As we're putting these things together, through storytelling, prior knowledge, and looking at a lot of the characteristics, what D. Fink has found is it's not just this foundational knowledge. When we teach, it's not just about the foundational knowledge. It's, it's really looking at how we process information from a lot of perspectives. For instance, if you want people to know something, like not to know, teach the knowledge, if you want them to apply something, you have to teach application. We know right now that if you just teach the knowledge component and then later say, now apply it, some people can, but it's difficult to apply until you see how to apply it. Here's a quick side note, just a quick one. I, I taught statistics for so many years. I love statistics. Um, you know, it's an inherently interesting field, right? So we like the statistics. Anybody who doesn't particularly care for statistics should not teach it. They should teach something boring like econ. So now, <laughs> just kidding. If we think about the statistics, on the first day of class, I used to say to my students, all right, think about how, think about as many ways as you can that a person who collects numbers for a living has impacted your life. Just any kind of numbers, any kind of data has impacted your life. A couple quick examples. What would that be? How people impacted your life. Yes? Graduate school. Graduate school. Okay, what numbers would they have collected? Gene expression levels. All right, good. All right. <laughs> Go for it. I like Very this. specific. So what I study is all numbers. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I, I'm just agreeing with you. I think that what you said was fabulous. I don't got a clue what it is. But you said it with authority, with conviction, and so I believe you. All right, other ways? Yes? Police officer. Oh, how would that work? The number of miles an hour you're going over the street. Oh, there you go, to write tickets for collecting numbers for that. Okay, so one more. All right, let's just pause for just, oh, one more, go ahead. Uh, doctors? Doctors. I work with, you mean physicians or doctors? <laughs> <laughs> See, they ask me, because I, I work in a hospital, they say, are you a real doctor? And I say, yes, I am not a physician. Um, that is not funny at you. At <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding around. Um, I, didn't, I forget about the videotape sometimes. <laughs> so, yes, for doctors collecting all kinds of information about very important things where they save lives on a daily basis. Um, <laughs> This is going to get me in trouble, but i got to go on this tiny little sidetrack here, too, is if anybody ever says, you know, what you do is important, but I like save lives, your response should be, yeah, me too. Because they'll say, if they make a mistake, a person could die. If you make a mistake, a person could die. They would. Because if you think about it, if a person is really dreaming about doing something, really in their heart has something you want to do, and we teach in such a way that makes it impossible for them to learn, and by the way, there's ways of doing that, and we make it almost impossible for them to learn, and therefore they don't do that thing. You find them years later, this shell of a person doing some task, it doesn't have to be a menial task, it could be anything even important, but it's not what they wanted. And so that day they died a little on the inside. And then the rest of their life, they're just a zombie-like worker. It's sad. We killed them, so we got to teach well. So the pressure is there. So here we go. The statistics thing. <laughs> I'm a little dramatic, but it's okay. So if you're looking at the chairs, all of the chairs you're sitting in are the same chairs, although we have different human beings in them. Somebody had to determine how high that chair should be. Somebody had to figure out how high the table should be, how bright the light should be, how wide the door should be, how, how many lumens this light should be up here. People have collected data on how wide roads should be, how hard it should be to turn a steering wheel to make a car change, how far should you turn the wheel or the ignition before that comes on while I'm on the car. It's how hard you'd push for the brakes to come in. On flights, they had to figure out how big the seats are and then reduce them by 20%. They had all of this stuff that people did, and they do that because, of course, they can put more seats in. They have now figured out on some airlines how to change the seat configuration so they can make the toilet smaller, yeah, even smaller than it was, and put like two more seats in the plane because that can generate X amount of revenue. Everything you do has data attached to it. I would say that to my students, and I'd say, now write all the things you can think about, and they would write long lists really fast. Just a few seconds before, they were struggling to come up with two or three things. If we want them to know application, we have to teach application. If we want to know integration, we teach integration. And then the whole left side of this thing is all about the human beings. I always tell people, and I think it's very important, and we've got good evidence on this one too, at the very least, a student should think you care about them. That's the very least. We should care, but they should at least think we care. Um, the point is that down the left-hand side, 
this human dimensions, we learn different ways, and, and caring is important, and teaching people how to learn. Boy, another one that I got the big soapbox on right now. We have really, really bright students going into universities who teaches people how to learn. And could you imagine if we take the really bright people at a younger age and teach people how to, how, how to work the process of learning? How to know when you're learning well, what's happening, what works well, what doesn't work well. If we taught people that, the amount that they could achieve would be significantly more than it currently is, which is based a lot of implicit assumptions in trial and error. Listening to music. Good solid research on this one, by the way. Do you know under what situation listening to music is actually beneficial? Number one, lot, I won't even ask you to raise your hands. A lot of people love to listen to music. They say, I must, my daughter does this. I have to listen to music or I can't study. Periodically, I'll go in the room and the music's not playing. And I'll say, hey, there's no music. She'll go, oh, wow, that's weird. Click and start playing again. I'll say, what have you been doing? She said, studying. I said, that's not physically possible. <laughs> because you told me you can't study without the music. She said, yeah, I was just really engrossed in this and I couldn't remember. I, I didn't notice it wasn't playing. I said, well, then that's weird. So you can study without the music. She said, no, I can't. So there's this really strong, implicit assumption there. When can you listen? What, under what circumstance would listening to music actually help? There is one. Now, this is while learning, if you're studying, though. If you're actually studying something. I'm going, a book, let's do book learning. I'm reading a book, and what times would music help you? Distraction. Distract you from the book? Oh, no, the music. Oh, oh. <laughs> that's good. Yes, if it's, basically, if it's basically melodic white noise, if what you're doing is having a noise that is in your immediate environment that you can tune out but drowns out the noise which might draw your attention, then it can be helpful. Some people, which you didn't do, good for you, will say like um, uh, instrumental music. It's not the fact that it's instrumental music. It's not meaningful music. It's something you won't listen to. If you're reading along going, what are you reading about? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> so this is the problem we run into. If there's actually music to study by on the internet, and I'm thoroughly convinced the internet's going to take off, so you should check it out. Um, <laughs> but the concept there is it's melodic noise and melodic noise, melodic white noise that's out there. So that helps. But learning how to learn, huge impact. So learning how to learn, the caring, human dimensions, we have all of these characteristics in here. Now, when we bring those into things like group work, how many of you have seen Hake's study stuff before? I mean, and how many have not? Raise your hand. How many of you are just morally opposed to raising your hands? Oh, that's good. None of you. That's really good. Usually there's a couple. Um, I'm just going to do this one really, really quickly. It's basically what Hake did, and this is only for content. He basically went in physics class, and he did a pretest. He did a post-test. Post-test minus the pretest gives you your gain. Each one of these data points here is an entire class. So this is 6,000 students. Basically normalized gains. And here's what they found. If, if for instance, your pretest was 80 for the whole group. The post test was 100. That'd be a 20 point gain. This line right here is the maximum, the G max here, that's the maximum amount you could get, which would be because of the 100% final test. You don't want 100% on the final anyway, it's a ceiling effect. So we don't care that no one's on this line, but the higher is more learning for these concepts, not for the other stuff that happens, just a concept test, which has its own issues, but it's a concept test. The point here is, he did this for high school, college, and university. Did it for interactive engagement, which means you stop lecturing periodically and you do active engagement kinds of things. A traditional lecture, a traditional lecture, there's great meta-analyses about traditional lectures too. You come in, I lecture, if you have any questions, come see me in my office hour and I walk out. That's a traditional lecture. What he found, 6,000 students, high school, college, and university, all of the lectures were down here amongst the worst of the interactive classrooms. So what I think that the team wanted me to share with you from the Center for Teaching and Learning and all the STEM stuff is that you should stop lecturing and do crappy group work and you'll break even. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's not the message of the day. Okay, hold on. The concept here is it's really hard if all a person does is lecture to keep up with this interactive engagement. Now here's what's really important, and I have to admit, I made a mistake on this when I first started talking about this stuff. In fact, Craig Nelson, who's at Indiana University doing all kinds of critical thinking stuff, he was one who said, you see, you can't keep up. The worst of the lectures can barely keep up with the best, I'm sorry, the best of the lectures with the worst of the interactive. 
there was no indication here of 100% engagement. The interactive engagement is a mixture of lectures and engagement. This is only lecture. Think about it for just a moment as if this was something like, what if this is exercise and this is diet and exercise? The concept here is that the interactive engagement was added to the lecture. There is still some lecture there. If we saw a study like this and said, you know, exercise will do this, but diet and exercise would do this, we wouldn't then come back and say, oh good, if this was for exercise and this is diet for exercise, we should stop exercising. See, that would not make sense, but there's been a whole generation of faculty members, because this is around 20 years old, who have used this and said, hey, we should stop lecturing. Carl Wyman has the same thing. Now, just say quickly, he did a lecture versus active learning, but the active learning was engagement with these things. And what I want to just point out is over and over again, the people who do all traditional lecturing 100% of the time cannot keep up with the individuals who bring in activities. It just doesn't happen over and over again. But none of this says to stop lecturing altogether. So those of you who do lecture and like lecture, I do think it does, it does not need to be vilified. I think there's some good components to it. It's just we shouldn't be doing it all the time. I wanted to throw this up as a background slide just to say group work and active learning is good and it's helpful. But once I got the slide and started looking at it, it suddenly occurred to me this actually explains exactly why group work should be done. Do you see it? It makes your students beautiful. <laughs> These are the best looking students in a group I've ever seen. So if you want your students to be as beautiful as these students, you should use group work. You notice what else it is about them? They're beautiful and what? Happy. Look how happy they are. What did you say over here? I said, I said no well, there's some diversity. I've gotten in trouble from this statement before, and it is being videotaped, but I will just say, and I try to do this in as kind a way as possible, it's the amount of diversity that shows some diversity but doesn't scare people. <laughs> if you look at shots that are staged, they will stage them in such a way that there's just the right amount of diversity, which drives me absolutely crazy because it's fake stuff. But yeah, they got just a little bit of diversity. got males and females. Oh, yeah. But here's the point. Act, in, in fact, I don't even know what she's looking at, <laughs> but she's happy. And here's the issue we do have, and i got to move on, but I'm just going to say this. So that was the big joke, because it makes them beautiful. Here's the thing. I think a lot of faculty, when they're using group work, think this. But the problem is that if we think this is what group work will look like, it's not what you tend to see. And what we tend to see from, again, study after study after study, is students, I mean, it's not a hard call here, students don't typically like group work. We typically like to do group work. I'm telling you right now, anytime I see something that ubiquitously is done and ubiquitously disliked, I think there's right for study there. Lots of study there. So I just, and, and what we find, by the way, and I just want to move on because we only have a few minutes left, is if we actually teach students how to work well in groups, we have, I've seen this in study after study, teach students how to work well in groups, they do not hate groups. The students who typically dislike the groups are ones that are told, if my head, if you think of me as a character, which isn't that hard, and this is like inside my head, and I'm thinking, ooh, history and systems of psychology. I know, I'm gonna put my students, I'm gonna have them work in groups of six, they'll come up with an important historical figure, they'll each take a piece of that historical figure, and then they'll do a group project, I'm gonna do a group grade, ooh, this will be great. Okay, everybody, get into groups of six. I'm thinking this is what's gonna happen. If I haven't taught you how to work well in groups, that idea that someday you're gonna have to work in groups, so you might as well learn it now, how about learning it now instead of just being thrown into it? You could teach your kids how to swim by saying, there's the deep end of the pool, go. But again, not the ideal way to teach them. By the way, um, this is what we're after, and this is more likely what the students are thinking. <laughs> that happens a lot. And I have a daughter who's now, a, 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 she's at UNC, and she's, she comes up with my best material for me. And she said, hey, Daddy, if you're going to show them this one, make sure you show them this, because they'll love this. <laughs> this is the same kid that when she went off to school on her first day of, of, at UNC, no, it wasn't UNC, it was some other place. <laughs> Dang, I hate videotapes. Uh, when she went off to school and she said, um, I said, how was your first day of school? And she said, ah, oh, you know, it was a syllabuster. 
Isn't that a great one? She comes up with the coolest stuff. A syllabuster is when you just basically talk so much the students can't participate, you just run through the syllabus, fill up the whole class period, and then walk out. That's a syllabuster. She did tell me if I ever tell anybody about the syllabuster that I should also point out that it is her favorite first day. So she wants you to do that. I don't. She does, but that's the point. Okay, so the concept here is if, if students are disliking these things, and by the way, if we teach them, teach them some specific components. We know on day one, and again, it doesn't take a, a, <laughs> it doesn't take a rocket surgeon to do this. Um, basically, on day one, we know when we assign groups, some of the people in the group are going to want to start on it that day. Other people are going to want to wait until the day before it's due. We know sometimes, or not sometimes, we know in every group there's going to be someone who's going to step up and try to take charge of the group. Sometimes they don't, but usually they don't. And there's going to be one free rider. There's going to be somebody in the group who tries to do stuff and can't deliver, and somebody else in the group's got to cover for them. There's going to be somebody who gets sick, and they get the flu, and everybody else is angry because that person did wait till the last minute. Now they got the flu. They can't get the work done. Somebody else has got to do it, and they didn't really want to do the work. And then there's a group grade. That's not fair. So we have all this stuff going on. We can teach them that out of the gate. And if you don't know how to do it, you go to your local center for teaching and learning. And they have plenty of resources and available res and stuff for you. All right. So we can work on that stuff. Whew. This is unfortunate because I got 12 minutes left and I'm down to point two. <laughs> ah, they'll go faster. That's the little book that I gave away. But here's the big thing. Teaching individuals metacognitive processes. Been shown over and over again to help out. And basically what we do on this one is teach people the learning process. Here's a funky little thing I've done with statistics for the longest time. I have students write down, at the, when they put their name on the test, write down what score do you think you're going to get on this test. Before you take the first question, what do you think you're going to get? End of the test, what do you think you got? Put that along with what they actually get. You got three scores that is very informative. If the person writes down 95, 70, and gets a 70, they walk through the door with the wrong level of anticipation. They realize taking the test that things didn't go well, and they actually were accurate based on the test of where they're at. Okay? Person comes through the door and writes 70, 95, and gets a 70. That's a whole different issue. Came through the door thinking they're going to get about a 70%, took the test and thought, I nailed it. Cuts the test back and thinks, wow, that's way worse than I expected. Anytime a student says, I didn't think it'd be that bad, has a poor cognition in terms of the metacognitive process on what actually happened during the test. I've had those poor students who have gone in and written down 95, 95, and scored a 60. They didn't know coming in, they didn't know going out. So the concept is once you think about it and play with it and, and work with it over time, you should get better and better at that. Studies show that people get better at it. Trying to reflect on different ways of studying. Here's one for you. Highlighting. I've spoken to many, many study, many, many fac, uh, sorry, student groups. If I ask student groups to what extent is highlighting effective, the students will say it is not effective. How about rereading? Not effective. What do you do? We highlight, we reread. I say, why do you do that? It's like, well, that's what you're supposed to do. I said, really? Because you just said it's not effective. They're, just, they're, they're confused on what to do. So if you can help teach them what types of things to do, practice at recall, talking to somebody else, teach back, and let me go home and tell somebody what you learned today. Write out what you learned in your own words and then later read it and rewrite it again in different words. Take a quiz over the material, make up flashcards. Do you, when you run through flashcards, if you get it right, do you put it off to the side or do you leave it in a the stack? There's research on that too. So the point is there's lots of stuff we know about study strategies and, and cognitive processing of this. It's a process of teaching the students these things. So if you get better at this stuff, it tends to get better. Oh, these are just cats. I don't have time. Well, it's, it's just it's classroom assessment techniques. There's several ways out there. If you just go to the internets and you type in, that's my daughter warned me of that. When you get old, you put the word the in front of stuff and make it plural. You know, going to the Walmarts. Now I'm saying going to the internets because I joke around with it too much. So go to the internets, type in classroom assessment techniques. If you have to, put in the name Angelo. There's all kinds of things because if you help the students see whether or not they're getting it. If at the end of the class I just say, okay, for one minute write down what you learned today. At the end of the class write down one thing that you found just a little bit confusing. At the end of class, what is one way you can apply this? 
At the end of a class, if you were going to make a newspaper clipping out of this, what would your headline be? Just something that makes a person say, okay, this, because what a student, what a human being can do is read a book, sit in a lecture, sit in a movie, anything like that. And I mean, I'm talking about lectures and books as well. Get to the end and realize, oh my goodness, for the entire time I was thinking about bacon. And then you realize nothing happened cognitively, but your eyes went across the pages, or you looked at the instructor and nodded and wrote stuff. And the people will look down and say, look what I wrote. That's weird. I don't remember any of this. We can zone out and keep going. If we actually test ourselves periodically, check and see these things, we can see if we're actually processing. When you're reading, you can do micro checks. A micro check is essentially as you're reading, you just stop periodically and say, okay, am I still focusing? You don't have to literally say, am I still focusing on a scale of one to five? I think a two. No, it's basically you just pause and then you keep going. That changes the situation from just kind of going through and, and Gosh, we shouldn't have a videotape here. I know a person that's not my wife. <laughs> she, reads, she reads at night, and what happens is she reads till she goes to sleep. And then the next day, she looks through the book to try to figure out where it was she stopped paying attention, and then she starts reading from there again, which means there's a chunk of the book where her eyes are going and she's not paying attention. You know, we don't have a lot of time to waste for academic reading. We should know when we're reading if we're reading well. And by the way, we also know very well if you are well rested and reading, there's an optimal reading you can do. I tell my students all the time, by the way, first day of classes, read the first five pages, time exactly how long it takes you to go through the pa those pages, and have a rough estimate of how much it takes you per day page to read. Two minutes, five minutes, whatever it takes. Calculus books, very different from novels. So the concept is just how long does it take you to read this stuff? Because then, when a person says, oh, I got a test tomorrow, I got to read two chapters, it's going to take me about an hour you know what you're talking about. It's not about an hour. This should take somewhere between 60 and 70 minutes. So that concept of starting to read and realizing three hours later you just got through it, that don't work too well. If you stop periodically and check, you can catch it right when it happens. That's good enough with that. Here's a task for you. How many of you seen this grid of pennies before? Anybody here? Oh, yeah. Just a couple people, of course. That's good. That's good. We like to use these in the field. All right, here's one quick one for you. Don't Google a penny, don't iPhone a penny, don't ask for help on this one. It's totally by yourself. Don't, you know, don't pull a penny out. It's just look up here and find which of these is the real US penny. And even, let me see if this is, I'm nervous I'm gonna turn off all the lights. I better just leave it alone. You got, no, don't share any information. It's all by yourself, all by yourself, totally by yourself. You're working from your memories. All right, got to keep moving for sake of time. All right, here's a cool deal. I'm just going to call these off real quickly. You just got to land on one pretty quickly now and be proud. When I say, do you think it's A, do you think it's B, put your hand in the area. If you look around and say, I wonder what other people are saying, that is weak. <laughs> Go for it. Are you ready? How about A's? Anybody like A? A couple A's, good for you. That's good. B's, C's, D's. Hmm. A couple D's, good. E's, F's, G. A couple G's, good. H's, nicely done. No? Okay, well, there's other H's. I's, that, ooh, look at all the I's. That is great. J's, very good. No, see how supportive I am, by the way? Um, K's, Excellent. L's, M's, no M's, N's, O's. That's cool. I think totally you got seven or eight. I think I missed one of them. In terms of the seven or eight, and you've looked at this thousands of times. The correct answer is none of the above. <laughs> I ask you which one of these was the real U.S. penny. It's none of them. They are representations of U.S. pennies. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I know, that's mean. I did that a few years ago, and one person in the audience said, it's none of them, and I said, yes, actually one of them is right. They said, no, it's not, and I said, yes, it is. They said, no, it's not, and we did that a little bit, and finally he said, they're all representations. <laughs> so I said, please, what, what discipline do you think would say such a thing? Philosophy. Very good, philosophy, very good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. And we all know that philosophers are just psychologists without data. So, um, <laughs> now, <laughs> that's the video again, it's gonna happen. Here's the deal. And just for sake of time here, um, 
We've looked at these pennies thousands and thousands of times. Mere repetition doesn't get something in a long-term memory. We have to pull meaning with it or else we just dismiss it. But here's what's even more important. Oh, by the way, if I don't tell you the right answer, none of you will listen. A is the right answer, <laughs> which there was a whole lot of people who picked I, and it's not that you're bad people, it's just that you didn't pick the right one. <laughs> it's like I tell my daughter, it's not your behavior I'm disappointed in, it's you. Um, <laughs> So who picked A? By the way, there was a couple. See, look at this. That is really good. So a couple of people, that's great. So here's the deal. There's a whole field out there, a whole area of that is so cool with psychology and the way that we process information. One of the things we do, if your brain is working properly, is when you have enough information to bring about a result, you stop processing. Because if you keep processing and processing and processing, it's a little like being OCD. You keep processing a lot of stuff. If everybody looked up here right now and right at this spot, and I said, what's on the back wall? Okay, it's almost difficult. It's really difficult to not look, I suppose. So what's on the back wall here, by the way? Anybody know for sure? Another room? That's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. A divider to breaks into another room. What color is the wall? Anybody know the color of the wall? It's weird. It's, yeah. so, so all of a sudden, you can look if you really have to. It's just... I can play a game in a big room and say, okay, somebody will say a big portrait, and I'll say, who's the portrait of? And before I know it, somebody's telling me this elaborate painting of something that doesn't exist. You shouldn't memorize everything. I could ask you how many lights there are in this room, and if you said, oh, there's 42, we'd worry about you. <laughs> so when we walk into the room, we need to know where's the front of the room, where are we going to be sitting, and everything else, and then we're done, and then we stop processing. When somebody's telling you a story that seems to be going on a long time and you know the point of the story, you stop processing. When a teacher is lecturing on a topic and the student thinks, okay, I got it, and then you bring up another example, because experts know details and little pieces. So when I'm saying, when you're doing classical conditioning and looking at the literature and looking at the research and looking at this stuff, you want to be very careful because sometimes an inhibitory stimulus looks a lot like a neutral stimulus. That it's just the results are the same, but for the inhibitory stimulus, you're actually masking something. And the students are saying, okay, you don't do anything. And if they feel like they got it, then they're done. And then they can think about bacon or whatever else they're thinking about. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so meat-centric. They could be thinking about a grilled portobello mushroom. So the concept here is we look at this, it's copper, it's this big, we're done, we don't pay attention to detail. In the class, be very careful. Students will look at what you're teaching and think, okay, here's the general thing, I've got it, let's move on. If you ask them, I've given you three, I'm going to give you three examples and I want you to tell me the, why I picked these three examples. What's going on there? Homework assignments. Instead of five homework problems, here's four homework problems, and then explain to me what I was going for. Those types of things cause people to look at the details and figure it out. Otherwise, the brain is wired to not do it. Think about the same kind of thing of the brain and how we work these things. If I were to stand behind a lectern, <clears throat> Think about this for just a second. Our brain is wired to discount constant stimuli. It does it because it's an adaptive mechanism for us. We want to focus our attention on things that move, things that could impact us, stuff that could kill us. Parked cars aren't going to hurt you. Moving cars are, which means you'll step right between two parked cars and look both ways to see if there's a moving car and then go across the street. But you'll step between those two parked cars and not even think about the fact that there are two cars there unless one of them is moving, like backing out, and then you'll wait. Moving objects, valuable. Station objects, not so valuable. We actually have something, sensory adaptation. We actually start to discount anything that's constant. Here's a physiological mechanism to explain. <clears throat> I see. In psychology, a classically conditioned response is a naturally occurring phenomenon in which an unconditioned stimulus reads, leads to some kind of an outcome, which we call an unconditioned response. If you take a neutral stimulus and pair it with the unconditioned stimulus, that previously neutral stimulus will come to elicit a response called a conditioned response that will be similar to, but not identical to, the unconditioned response. If we now take the unconditioned stimulus and pair it with a new stimulus, and a neutral stimulus, if you will, that new stimulus will come to elicit a new response, which we will call 
call CR2 or a condition response to, it never actually has to be paired with an unconditioned stimulus, which was kind of fascinating because it means the original stimulus is no longer present, and yet you're creating a response which is similar to, but not identical to, that actual physiological response that is natural in our, our it's a natural process. Sorry about messing up that last sentence. Now, <laughs> the which? I almost yawned myself. I am so bored right now, I can't stand it. But when we say it was boring, that lecture is boring, it's not that it's boring, it's the brains are actually discounting the information to the point of not being able to attend to it. You have to fight to attend to that. It's not because of disinterest, it's the way we're wired. We got dopamine. All right, we started five minutes late. I promise I will finish within the next couple of minutes. I had to have some myths. I got some evidence stuff out there. Anybody ever see this learning pyramid? We know 5% of what we hear, 10% of what we read, 20% of what we see. Cool, if you ever have a few minutes, go look up learning pyramid and myths. This is made up. This is all just made up stuff. It's pretty cool. The reason they caught that it was made up, by the way, I've taught methods for a long time. Look at these numbers. Yeah, see, you're all laughing. I can tell. I can tell the scientists when I'm speaking to a group of people who are quantitatively oriented because if you ever have somebody, if one of your students turns in a study, an observation, or whatever you're reading some, if you see 90, 75, 50, 30, 20, 10, 5, yeah, go look it up. And basically what happened is somebody was reading this report from the National Teaching Learning Laboratories and said, these numbers look very similar, went to the original citation. The citation didn't have the numbers in it. Called the author of the article. The author of the article says, I never put those numbers in there. And called back here and said, wait, what about those numbers? And the NTL says, well, the person who did this is no longer working here, but we do own the copyright, so if you ever use the pyramid, you must cite us. So I'm <laughs> citing them. National Training Learning, they get all the credit for this all the credit. It's not my work, it's theirs. Learning styles, on the last things here. There's a whole concept, we have study after, not study, article after article has talked about meshing, teaching to a given learning style. We got our, we'll use VARC because VARC's a good index. Visual, VARC, visual, auditory, kinesthetic. Visual, auditory, kinesthetic. The theory is, I teach visual, I put visual things in from my visual learners, auditory things in, kinesthetic things in, and students learn better. Problem is, there's no evidence for that. In fact, it's really tricky to find evidence that the learning styles exist, but take two considerations, if you will. Number one, if it really were true that the visual people had to have visual stuff, if I showed a really good visual representation and gave you all the quiz, you folks should outscore you folks because it's visual, you're auditory and kinesthetic. If I do a kinesthetic task, you folks should outscore the rest of the room. Doesn't actually happen. If I do a really good visual task, even though you are visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, everybody seems to learn. The good news is this, multimodal presentation is advantageous. So teaching stuff that's got visual, auditory, and kinesthetic stuff is good. So I'm not telling you, to, if you've been teaching to different learning styles, keep teaching that way. Blend it all together. Just don't teach it as if the students specifically learn from a given style. That's most important, and I'll show you an example of that right now, and then we will be done. The other part is, where did you find, if you are a visual learner, think for just a moment, this is where we process stuff, or we don't process stuff. Think about where you would have found out that you're a visual learner. See, I used to ask people who's visual learners. That's like a trap. That's just mean. So here's the deal. If you were a visual learner, where would you have found out, see somebody else mythically, where would you have found out you're a visual learner? How would you find this out? I have students every day telling me, oh, I'm a visual learner. I'm a kinesthetic learner. Almost all visual learners, though. Where do you get your visual learningness? Or where do you find out? The diagnostic criteria for this. VARC has a questionnaire. You can go online and take a questionnaire. And the questionnaire will be things like, do you prefer to do this or do you prefer to do that? It's a learning preferences inventory. But the other part of this, and I could ask my psychologist colleagues at some point, if you want to know about some state or trait, if some trait of an individual, a free self-scored 20 item questionnaire on the internet, not an ideal place to go. You can't go take a bunch of items and just say, ooh, look at me, I'm this. The other place it comes from is teachers who come by and say, wow, you are very good at drawing. You know what, that, you're a visual learner, aren't you? And you say, uh-huh. I mean, you're eight years old, why not? So it's like, uh-huh. And later in life, someone says, are you, what kind of learner are you? Oh, I'm visual. I don't even remember why. 
So the problem is people will put themselves in categories, and this is where I'll end, is this is from the onion. So I want to make sure to have really good evidence. <laughs> Nasal learners demand an odor-based curriculum. See this little girl? She's a nasal learner struggling with an odorless textbook. So sad. The bottom quote that gets cut off here, but I've done this enough, I've just memorized this thing, is it said, my 15-year-old daughter, Chloe, used to goof off and get in trouble with her friends. Now I realize all those Ds and Fs did not represent any failure on my daughter's part, but rather the school's failure to provide an appropriate nasal-based curriculum. If I'm a visual learner and you don't use visuals, it's not my fault, it's your fault. If I'm a certain type of learner and you don't teach to me, then it's your fault, I'm not learning. And so what I have with students all the time who says, um, Dr. Z, I'm a, like a visual learner and you don't use a lot of visuals. First thing is when they say visual learner, I say, ah, me too, which gets camaraderie. We're all together, we're visual learners. And then we've talked through a little bit about this, but be careful about that response. So, all right. I've done well because my entire life I go five minutes over and everywhere I've gone, I was going to leave like six minutes for questions, which means I'm right on time being five minutes over, but I didn't leave question time, which is unfortunate. However, I can hang around for a few minutes and answer questions if they are here, but I know some of you have places to get to go, so I should stop. So hopefully, going through and looking at this, summarizing the big pieces, we have to be careful about the dichotomy of saying, here's passive versus active, here's engaged versus lecturing, we should chuck lecturing, we should chuck passive. We have to be very careful about saying people get bored during lectures because we don't know exactly what's going on there, but we do know we have to mix some things up once in a while. We now definitely have to watch out for learning styles because that's an issue that we have to get into. But the big thing is just learning how to process information and thinking about how we're doing things has a huge impact on how people process information and what they can do. But you've got to mix those things up. Oh, and the active learning part. Still has to be in there. And there's where, oh, there's the green book again. 101 educationally designed active. There's a whole bunch of stuff on the web, though. You don't have to buy the book. Um, but the concept is there's a lot of easy things to do. And I would still argue, go see the folks who do this for a living. They can just sit down and help walk it through it so easily. But I would really encourage folks to start small. If you're doing lots of lecturing, maybe a little think, pair, share. Bring in some smaller things. Down the road, you can completely change your class all up and everything else, but you know, start small, but bring something into it. But I'm gonna stop there. So, let's stop, right? Should we stop? Please, thank you. Thank you.